Hello Mark, uh, this is Hank and my student number is number 31 and uh, the title of the art of the speech is How to Make Hard Choices by Ruth Chan Think of a hard choice you'll face in the near future It might be between two careers, artist and accountant or place to leave the city or the country or even between two people to marry. You could marry Betty or you could marry Lolita. Or it might be a choice about whether to have a cho to have children, to have a to have an allowing parent mo moving with you to raise your child in a religion that your partner leaves by but leave you cold or whether to donate your life savings to charity. Chances are the hard choice you thought of, of was something big, something momentous, something that matters to you. Hard choices, hard choices seem to be occasions for agonizing, heart wringing, the gnashing of teeth. But I think we've misunderstood hard choices and the role they play in our lives. Understanding hard choices uncovers the hidden power each of us possesses. What makes a choice hard is the way the alternative, alternatives relate. In any easy choice, one alternative is better than the other. In a hard choice, one alternative is better in some ways, the other alternative is better in other ways, and neither is better than the other overall. You agonize over whether to stay in your current job in the city or uproot your life for move challenging work in the country because staying is better in some ways. Moving is better in, the, in others and neither is better than the other overall. We shouldn't think that all hard choices are big. Let's say you are deciding what to have for breakfast, you can have high fiber brain cereal or a chocolate donut. Suppose what matters in the choice is uh, tastiness and healthfulness. The cereal is better for you. The donut tastes way better, but neither is better than the other overall. A hard choice, realizing that small choices can also be hard, may make big hard choices seem less intractable. After all, we managed to figure out what to have for breakfast, so, may so maybe we can figure out whether to st stay in the city or uproot for the new job in the country. We also shouldn't think that hard choices are hard because we are stupid. When I graduated from college, I couldn't decide between two careers, philosophy and law. I really loved philosophy. There are amazing things you can learn as a philosopher, and all from the comfort of an armchair. But I came from a modest immigrant family where my, where my idea of luxury was having a pork tongue and jelly sandwich in my, in my school lunchbox. So the thought of spending my whole life sitting around in armchairs just thinking, well, this struck me as the height of extravagance and free frivolity. So I got off my yellow pad, I drew a line down the middle, and I tried my best to think of the reasons for and against each alternative. I remember thinking to myself, if only I knew what my life in each career would be like, if only God or Netflix would send me a DVD of my two possible future careers, I'd be sad. I'd compare them side by side, I'd see that one, is, one was better and the choice would be easy. But I got no DVD and because I couldn't figure out which was better, I did what many of us do in hard choices. I took the safest option. Fear, for be, fear of being an un, unemployed philosopher led me to become a lawyer and as I discovered, lawyering didn't quite fit.
it wasn't who I was, so now I'm a philosopher. And I study hard choices, and I, I can tell you that fear of the unknown, while a common motivational default is dealing with hard choices, rests on a, my, on a, misconception, on a misconception of them. It's a mistake to think that in hard choices, one alternative really is better than the other, but we are too stupid to know which, and since we don't know which, we might as well take the least risky option. Even taking two alternatives side by side with full information, a choice can still be hard. Hard choices are hard not because of us or our ignorance. They are hard because there is no best option. Now, if there is no best option, if the scales don't tip in favor of one alternative over another, then surely the alternatives must be equally good. So maybe the right thing to say in a hard choice is, is that they are between equally good options. But that can be right. If alternatives are equally good, you should just flip a coin between them and it seems a mistake to think. Here's how you should decide between careers, places to live, people to marry, flip a coin. There's another reason for thinking that hard choices aren't choices between equally good options. Suppose you have a choice between two jobs, you could be an investment banker or a graphic artist. There are a variety of things that matter in such a choice, like the excitement of a work, achieving financial, financial security, having time to raise a family, and so on. Maybe the artist career puts you on a cutting edge of new forms of pictorial expression. Maybe the banking career puts you on a cutting edge of new forms of financial manipulation. Im image, imagine the two jobs, however you like, however you like so, that neither is better than the other. Now suppose we improve one of them a bit. Suppose the bank ruin you at five hundred dollars a month to your salary. Does the extra money now make the banking job better than the artist one? Not necessarily. A higher salary makes the banking job better than it was before, but it might not be enough to make being a banker better than being an artist. Now, if an improvement in one of the jobs doesn't make it better than the other, then the two original jobs could not have been equally good. If you start with two things that are equally good and you improve one of them, it now must be better than the other. That's not the case with options in hard choices. In hard choices. So now we've got a puzzle. We've got two jobs, neither is better than the other, nor are they equally good. So how are we supposed to choose? Something seems to have gone wrong here. Maybe the choice itself is problematic and com comparison is impossible. But that can't be right. It's not like we're trying to choose between two things that can't, that can't be compared. We're weighing the merits of two jobs after not the merits of the number nine nine and a plate of fried eggs a comparison of the overall merit of two jobs is something we can make and one we often do make i think the puzzle arises because of an unreflective assumption we make about value we unwittingly assume that values like justice, beauty, kindness, and, and akin to scientific quantities like length, mass, and weight. Take any comparative question not involving value, such as which of two suitcases is heavier. There are only three possibilities. The weight of one is greater, lesser, or equal to the weight of the other. Properties like weight can be represented by real numbers, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And there are only three possible comparisons between any two real numbers. One number is greater, lesser, 
or equal to the author, not so with values as post in enlightened enlightenment creatures. We tend to assume that scientific thinking holds the key to everything of importance in our in our world, but the world of value is different from the world of science. The stuff of the one world can be quantified by real numbers. The stuff of the other world can't. We shouldn't assume that the world of is of lengths and weights has the same structure as the world of out of what we should do. So if what matters to us, a child's delight, the love you have for your partner, can't be represented by real numbers, then there's no reason to believe that in choice there are only three possibilities, that one alternative is better, worse or equal to the other. We need to introduce a new fourth relation beyond being better, worse or equal that describes what's going on in the hard choices. I like to say that the alternatives are on the par. When alternatives are on the par, it may matter very much which you choose. But one alternative isn't better than the other. Rather, the alternatives are in the same neighborhood of value, in the same league of value, while at the same time being very different in kind of value. That's why the choice is hard. Understanding hard choices in this way uncovers something about ourselves we didn't know. Each of us has the power to create reasons. Imagine a world in which every choice you face is an easy choice. That is, there's always a best alternative. If there's a best alternative, then that's the one you should choose. Because part of being rational is doing the better thing rather than the worst thing. Choosing what you have most reason to choose. In such a world, We'd have most reason to wear black socks instead of pink socks, to eat cereal instead of donuts, to live in the city rather than the country, to marry Betty instead of Lolita. A world full of only easy choices would enslave us to reasons. When you think about it, it's nuts to believe that the reasons given you, given to you, the dictated that you have most reason to pursue the exact hobbies you do, to live in the exact house you do, to work at the exact job you do. Instead, you faced alternatives that were on a uh, par, were on the par hard choices. And you made reasons for, to, for yourself to choose that hobby, that house, and that job. When alternatives are on the par, the reasons given to us, the reasons that determine whether we are making a mistake are silent as to what we do. It's here, in the space of hard choices, that we get to ex exercise our normative power, the power to create reasons for, you for yourself, to make yourself into the kind of person for whom country living is preferable to the urban life. When we choose between options that are on a par, we can do something really rather remarkable. We can put our very selves behind an option. Here's where I stand. Here's who I am. I am for banking. I am for chocolate donuts. This this response in hard choices is a rational cho response, but it's not dictated by reasons given to us. Rather, it's supported by reasons created by us. When we create reasons for ourselves to become this kind of person rather than that, we wholeheartedly become the people that we are. You might say that we become the authors of our own lives. So when we face hard choices, we shouldn't beat our head against a wall trying to figure out which alternatives is better. 
there is no best alternative. Instead of looking for reasons out there, we should be looking looking for reasons in here. Who am I to be? You might decide to be a pink sock wearing, cereal loving, country loving, country living banker, and I might decide to be a black sock wearing, urban donor loving artist. What we do in hard choices is very much up to each of us. Now, people who don't exercise their normative powers in hard choices are drifters. We all know people like that are drifted into being a lawyer. I didn't prove my agency behind lawyering. I wasn't for lawyering. The drifters allow the were to write the story of their lives, they let mechanisms of reward and punishment pass on their head, fear and easiness of an option to determine what they do, so the lesson of hard choices. Reflect on what you can put your agency behind, on what you can be for, and through hard, cho and through hard choices, become that person. Far from being sources of agony and dread, hard choices are precious opportunities for us to celebrate what is special about the human condition. They are the reasons that govern our choices as correct or incorrect sometimes run out. And it is here in the space of hard choices that we have the power to create reasons for ourselves to become the distinctive power people that we are and that's why our choices are not a curse but a godsend. Thank you. Applause.